Hello, everybody, and welcome back to At The Elephants. I'm your host, Rob Morris. I have an awesome episode for you today. I'm not even going to waste a lot of time in the intro here getting into it. I just want to uh, update you on a couple of things that have to do with the podcast. If you're following the show, I've noticed as we picked back up already with this first uh, episode with Joshua Morgan, we got some people engaged, they're back listening and all that kind of stuff. I just want to explain how the show is going to work for a little while. I'm in the process of migrating all of the past episodes uh, that used to live. uh, They're all going to be in the same place. They're going to still be on Spotify. They're going to be on Stitcher. They're going to be on Apple Podcasts and all that. But the the hosting platform that I was using to get the episodes on all of those platforms, not interesting. But the point is I'm moving hosting platforms. I'm changing from Podbean to Anchor. Um, And what that means for you guys listening to the show is it may have a slight delay before I get all the audio episodes up. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you want to go try to listen to the audio only version, um, they will be up and all of the back catalog of At The Elephants is going to be up as well. All, I think, 64 episodes of it will be available on all platforms soon if they're not already. Um, But that process is proving to be slightly more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, But I very much am in the process of getting it done. So it will be available on all the platforms very, very soon. But in the meantime, you can get every single episode of it on YouTube. That is going to be the main platform for the video as well as uh, where the episodes are going to live for one week. So hopefully for a while now. Every week on Monday, there will be a brand new episode of At The Elephants available on YouTube, full video, end to end. And one week later, on the following Monday, last week's episode will be available on all the audio platforms. So essentially, it's available exclusively on YouTube for one week, and I'm going to throw it out one more time. If you're not on YouTube Premium, ad-free, close your phone and listen to it, everything that you're going to need for the future YouTube Premium, everybody. I, they're never going to sponsor me, and I don't give a shit, but I've been paying for YouTube Premium for like four years, and I've not regretted it. I've never canceled it. Uh, it is more than worth the money, and it is the best way to uh, engage with long-form content on YouTube is to have YouTube Premium because you can close your phone, you can listen to it if you want, and then you can pop your phone right back open and check it out again. Let's move on. Let's talk about our guests for this week. Great guest this week. Um I have a bunch of episodes already recorded that are in the can, so to speak, and they'll be coming out very soon. I have so many great guests coming up. Stephen Kopp, uh, Matt Van Gessel, Andrew Jernigan, Shayna Penn. The list goes on and on. So many great episodes are on their way to you, and they'll be coming out every Monday. But I just couldn't hold on to this one. I didn't even know this guy lived in Los Angeles. He's been here for like a month. And uh, before that, he was in New York for like 10 years. My dear, dear friend, Charles Osborne, uh, who is going to be on the show. You might know him at a star Osborne on social media because on TikTok and Instagram, he's really blown up and created quite a name for himself. He's on Cameo. He's going to talk about it. But if you need a fucking Cameo from this guy, sling him some dough. Get yourself a Jennifer Coolidge impression video for your birthday or whatever the fuck people use Cameo for. Go get it. Um, But you're not going to have to wait to hear some fantastic uh, pieces of information and impressions and all the things that he has to offer. I'm not being the most articulate right now, but I don't re-record these. I do them in one take. One take at the elephants, Rob. That's what this is. Um, You're not going to have to wait uh, to get some incredible laughs and a really good time from Charles Osborne. Um, As I mentioned uh, in the previous episode, um, I'm doing a lot of these episodes over Zoom because I want to connect with people who do not live in Los Angeles. And uh, that's how I would say probably the majority of these episodes are going to be is, uh, you know, online. And if you're listening to it, for the most part, you're not even going to notice. But I will say, Nothing beats an in-person interview. It's so much better. I don't even know why I call them interviews. They're not really even interviews if you listen to this show. I talk too much for them to be called interviews. It's a conversation. It's a chat. And these chats are so much better when I can get them in person. I had Charles over here to my apartment in Los Angeles, my little studio in my living room here. And um, we had a wonderful conversation that you're about to enjoy. And if you are listening to this, I definitely 
definitely encourage more than normal that you go to YouTube and if I figure out how to get the video version on Spotify, you might be able to check it out there. But YouTube is where the visual video of this episode is going to live. And I strongly encourage you to check that out because if you know Charles, you know he's an animated dude. And the best version of this episode of this show today is on YouTube for sure. Um, enough selling YouTube. I'm not doing it anymore until they give me some money. Um, I'm excited for you guys to enjoy this episode. Uh, the last thing, I had another thing that I was going to mention to you guys before we got into it. I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, I'm not a big fan of and haven't for years been into the whole, hey, like, subscribe, boop do, give me a rating on Apple Podcasts, or whatever. Do that if you want. If you like the show, like it. If you want to subscribe, go ahead. I don't really give a shit. I, it just feels weird and cringy to me to like ask me, hey, like and subscribe. I hate that. I don't know why. I've always not liked it. I might have done it years ago if you dig that up. I'm sure I'm sure at some point I was doing it. But at some point, I changed my mind and I hate that. But I will say this. Um, if you like the show, if you enjoy the show, if you're listening to this right now, share it with somebody. This is a very niche show right? This is uh, mostly for people who went to School of the Arts, know North Carolina School of the Arts, are familiar with the school. Um, mostly that's who it's for, or if you know the individual guest. Um, so that being said, we this show does the best and it serves the purpose of entertaining that group of people. That's, that's the reason why this is here. So if you like the show and you're still connected with anybody at School of the Arts uh, that you went to school with, that you know goes to school there now, that teaches there, that used to teach there, whatever, share this with them. And the easiest way to do that is to send them a link to the show here on YouTube, or um, we're publishing Instagram Reels almost every day of the week. Find your favorite Reel, share it to your story, send it to your friends, let everybody know the show's back. We've been doing the show for eight years, and it's my favorite thing. I put a lot of work into it for free. I've never gotten a dime for doing this show. I don't anticipate starting to get a dime for it anytime soon. So if you like the show, just share it with somebody. Let somebody know, hey, Rob's doing that fucking podcast thing again. Just let them know. Um, very last thing before we get to Charles is I do have another podcast that is um, a huge passion project and baby of mine called We Are New. I do the show with my wife and my roommate. And uh, it is also available on YouTube, and you can find clips of it all over Instagram as well. And on my page, it's called We Are New, one more time. And uh, it's a blast. It's super fun. Um, we don't publish every single week. It's a little more intermittent than that because we both, the three of us, are very busy with so many projects. It takes so much more work to make that show. It's a multi-cam show, and it's produced with games and bits and all this super fun stuff. But it is worth checking out. So if for some reason you enjoy me and my voice and my silly attitude and thoughts on things, you're going to get a lot more of it. Plus, you'll get to know my wife and my very good uh, friend, Kyle DeLuca, who's our roommate, and um, at this point is slowly becoming almost a, a you know, a semi-NCSA alum in that um, he's just getting to know everybody through me. He's met so many of them, and so many of his friends now, especially out here in LA, uh, are graduates or, or friends of the circle. So get to know me, get to know my wife, Candice. She's amazing. I wouldn't have married her if she wasn't. And um, get to know Kyle on We Are New. Uh, all episodes are available on We Are New Studios, the YouTube channel. It's great. It's fun. Let's get to the episode, everybody. Strap in and strap on for Mr. Charles Osborne at A Star Osborne. If you're not following him on all platforms, sit, pause. Pause this fucking thing. Go to Instagram. Go to TikTok. Follow at A Star Osborne because he produces amazing content. It's we're going to get into it in the episode, but it's super fucking funny. You'll see how much he makes me laugh. He's going to make you laugh. Um, all right. Let's get to it. Dude, thank you so much for like coming here and doing this. I'm so happy to be here, baby. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I like do I'm doing them over Zoom now and I hate that, but I miss everybody in New York and I don't want to wait anymore until the next time I go there. So I've been yeah. biting the bullet and doing it digitally. So at least I'm doing something because this That's is good. one of my favorite things. But when I can get somebody in person, it's way better. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about that in-person connection. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you have... 
an inexplicable ability to make things sound dirtier than <laughs> they than they ever needed to be. Wait, have you seen that thing that's blowing up on the internet right now um, about the 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 person who plays Rhaenyra on House of the Dragon? No, I, I'm waiting till that show like finishes its season to binge so, it. So, uh, the girl who plays Alicent is inter- they're like interviewing each other like just like stupid dumb celebrity questions and she's like what's your favorite drink or she's like what's your drink of choice and then the actor playing Rhaenyra they go a Negroni <laughs> Spagliato <laughs> with Prosecco in it <laughs> and just like dripping with porno vibes yeah I'm like well I'm wet <laughs> like I'm you know like like just it's in, it's so delicious that like oh like, yeah. like what do you think that is like I, I feel like it's definitely I don't know what it there's a certain kind of person that is able to do that a I've, British person a British, British per, you're not British and you're doing the same thing I'm do, well I'm imitating just her make it, yeah but before oh. with the intimate connection line oh maybe it just takes someone who's a real that's louch. just you <laughs> louse I don't know what it's a, I don't know what word I, I'm new at English don't don't push <laughs> yourself um welcome to Los Angeles dude Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I've been planning this move for several years, but I wanted to be strategic about it. What? So talk to me about that. Like, what brought you out here, and how long were you where before this? And um, well, I was in New York for ten years, and uh, I, I, it was a very hard time, and and I I worked nonstop, but I was very much on my own in that. I was booking everything by myself. I Nobody knew what to do with me. You mean like representation-wise? Representation, representation wise? didn't know what to do with me. They'd like send me out for Danny Zuko. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, do you see me? Like, <laughs> I, Do you see my face as right. I hear you say that? Yeah. So I was like, well, I'm going to do this respect. the way I want to. And then they're like, can you come back as the guy that moons everybody? I'm like, yes, thank you. Like, hello. <laughs> so like- <laughs> Like I'm, I'm the guy who finished beauty school. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Beauty school valedictorian. There you go. Um, I, uh, yeah. So, so I, 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 but I made my own work for 10 years and, mm. and also booked a lot of off Broadway shows that were really big and popular, but I sort of felt like I'd hit my plateau as far as I could get in the business as both an actor and a writer without any help. And right. I, and no, and like, no matter what I did, nobody would even consider me for their the privilege of their rejection is what I would say. Gotcha. You know, so it was like, it's not like I was getting rejected. It's like, people were just like, literally the, we're not responding to an email to even consider what you are. Wow. Um. So I was like, well, fuck off. Sure. <laughs> like, I was like, so I'm going to go. And then things started taking off for myself. And I was like, well, if I'm making a living and, uh, and working for myself, why don't I do that in a place that I love? And so I was like, so I've been planning this move for a long time, like just trying to be strategic about when I went and what I wanted to get out of it. So are you, are you from Charlotte? Where are you from? Yeah. Yeah. Charlotte. You're from North Carolina originally. Mm-hmm. Have you spent a lot of time in LA before you moved here? Yeah. I performed at the Hollywood bowl, uh, a few, uh, a few years ago. So oh, shit. which was freaking amazing. What were you doing there? I did the producers with what? Dane Cook, Rebecca Romaine, Jesse Tyler Ferguson, Richard Kind, and, um, and Gary Beach, who was who was a School of the Arts alumni, who originated the role of the director and the producers on Broadway and won a Tony Award for it, and he was one of my heroes because he's like just I over love the top like and all the people you just said. It was the best time, and I was like, I may never be back here again. I am gonna eat this up. I was like. The, I had the zoomies for like a month. You belong <laughs> on stage with Richard Kind. Can I say that enough times? <laughs> Thank like you. that is a perfect. If if getting you guys in the same zone, you guys have such similar like energy. Such similar yells <laughs> <laughs> for our punchlines. He's so. It's such a big thing, and yeah. that's so cool, dude. So you were Eight, out here for how long? Yeah. I was out here for um two months doing that, and it was like 18,000 seats. It's incredible. Yeah. And like, I had, you know, I was like in the ensemble, but I had lines, and you're like, you get to make 18,000 people laugh. You know? What does that feel like? It's like a ripple, because you have to wait for the sound to travel up the canyon. Be a little careful that you don't block that oh, camera right. with your arm. That's okay. Yeah. Oh. Um, 
It was amazing. <laughs> you don't have to not talk with your hands because I don't want to take that from you. Oh, yeah. I want you to have it, but just like, will, on a diagonal. I will diagonal it. I'll be, just be Elijah. There I dress the part. There you For go. those of you listening at home, I'm wearing, looks like Michael Jackson and Liberace. I was going <laughs> to say, thanks for dressing down and, and making me look. Um, this is what I wore to the taco truck today. This is just how I dress. <laughs> I love the glasses. Can Thank we talk about you. the glasses for a I've second? I've got yellow glasses on. They're really big 70s style, like giant oversized glasses. Right. And with yellow lenses. And they just give everything in the world a little lift. Or do you need glasses at all? I do. I'm wearing contacts. These are just for my vanity. You have contacts on and then like colored frames for fun. Yeah, baby. That's the way to live. It looks great. I get a lot of shit because people see my glasses and I don't have a severe prescription, but it is prescription. They're not mm -hmm. totally fake, but it's mostly for like an astigmatism. And cause my, it, it gets, it's because I have such incredibly beautiful blue eyes that when the light comes in, it blinds the shit. Some people might be listening and they might have those like, you know, very, very dark brown eyes, which I'm sorry, but like, <laughs> but, but you don't know what it's like to go out and, and have even these lights we have in here for this podcast. It's like, I need the glasses, oh, the yeah. glare I have, protection. I have, is, I have green eyes. Oh, I know. I like, wouldn't talk shit about brown eyes with you in front of well, me. Well, I mean, I, I, I love you had people them. talking shit about me. It turns me on. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> let me add that to my list <laughs> of subjects. Um, <laughs> we, you just, you did Liza a second ago, so I'm going to go straight to like, you're one of my favorite impressionists. Oh, thank you. The And, and I, I, I want to talk about Jen Coolidge for a second. Can we oh, talk? Oh, Jennifer Coolidge. Oh, you know, like from Best in Show and Legally Blonde. And, you know, I saw her play Lady M at the Royal Shakespeare Company of Hoboken. <laughs> That's not true. No. <laughs> <laughs> One second being like, I want to see that so fucking bad. I hope imagine? it was real. I have made like my social media thing. About, my thing about Jennifer Coolidge that yeah. I do on social media is right. literally like my graduate thesis demonstrating that every single film would be better if she was in it. That's true. It is hysterical. Her line readings and her opinions on things and just her natural rhythms. It's She's like, like I really, really respect her as a comedian and as just a, an amazing person to watch. You're she's like, so good. She's She steals the show in everything. And then, and then the she finally got her due with, with an Emmy and... Uh, the White Lotus. And it was, if you saw that show, it's a star studded cast of brilliant dramatic actors. And she like mopped the floor. Yeah. She was incredible. Really, really good. Oh. There's some uh, asshole named Jake Lacey in that, I think. Yes, another school of the arts I think alumni. We know, I think we know oh. this guy. Oh, you're good. I can't contain you. I'm sorry. They can't be done. Uh, you do your best and I'll <laughs> I'll deal with the rest. Don't trip. Um, it's all good. What? No, I love that you, first of all, I love that you were doing that. I've been a fan of Jen Coolidge forever. When did, what, what was the first thing you saw her in? Like, what was the first thing that you kind of clocked her in? Legally Blonde. Yeah. I remember seeing Legally Blonde and being like, who is this wonderful creature? My life is now devoted to you. Like, and so then I just started following every single movie that she did. And just because I was like, I'd be like, oh, that looks like a bad movie. Oh, Jennifer Coolidge is in it. I'm going to, you know, I'll camp out of the theater. Right. I, I just love her. I, I I just love those idiosyncratic performers. Right. Like Liza Minnelli or yeah. like Bette Midler or or Jennifer Coolidge. Like people, people who you just instantly recognize and they have their own opinion on things. It's so unique. I mean, I, yeah. I just, I just, I love that. I love her. She, she has a unique voice, obviously, which is a lot of what your, I feel like the two things that really make up your impression are the voice and the big fake tits. Oh yeah. Like they are they're balloons. They're balloons. <laughs> I have literally balloons. And I was filming a, a promo for, I was just in this off-Broadway show and they hired me to do some social media ads for, for them. Oh, um, cool. Like as you or as posts, Jen? Or? Whatever I wanted. They were like, wow. whatever you want, just put it they on your They saw page. your social and were like, this dude gets us? Well, or? I was in the cast. I was right. I was uh, in the cast and then they, they didn't realize that I had this big following. And they were like, hey, can we pay you? And I was like, yes, you can. There you and, go. Uh, and so I did one thing. If of you like, can get two checks at one job. Right, exactly. Do that shit. So, so the thing was, it was a musical comedy, uh, 
updating of Romeo and Juliet. Okay. With this mobster twist. It was called Romeo and Bernadette. And it was like Romeo took the the sleeping potion. He slept like 500 years and he woke up in uh, 1950s Brooklyn and he falls in love with a mob boss's daughter named Bernadette. And it was, it was a really funny show. Really, really sweet. It was actually surprisingly sweet. Yeah. Anyway, so I did Jennifer Coolidge as Juliet in this Romeo and Juliet thing. And it was like the whole like death scene, like, you know, oh, oh, what are the lines from the death scene? Why can't I think of these anymore? We used to have all these memorized. I know. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) But it was just like, oh, there rest and let me die. Ouch, ouch, ouch. And then I popped one of the balloon tits. (laughs) While I'm doing the death scene and Romeo is splayed out. And I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I love that. It was brilliant. It was so fun. Dude, it is it is so cool to see your journey on social media and this following that you've kind of gained. Because when I, we were at school together, we only I, th- I think we only did one show together. And that was Edwin Drood. Oh, yes. That was the only thing that I think we were both on at the same time. And... I remember you coming to like parties at my house when you were a first year and and clocking you immediately like this guy's fucking hilarious and I always love being around you but I never got to really work on anything we weren't in the same class. And then when we did Edwin Drood and I usually try not to tell too many stories from school cuz people are like I wasn't there I don't give a shit. But I'd never even heard of that play before. I didn't know the show at all and I was um like a third year assistant director under John Langs and had to look up like, who the fuck is Rupert Holmes? This guy who wrote one musical ever that just swept the fucking Tonys that year. And I didn't know what it was. And we got into rehearsals for that. And the thing that I loved about the way John directed it, I mean, he did a great job from top to bottom. That was one of my favorite shows I did at school for sure. But one of the things that I loved about that show is that we started it with him saying, this is a very much a play within a play you are all playing two characters. You're playing the character in Victorian England that is putting on the show tonight. And the audience in our show, there is no fucking fourth wall in that play. It is very much direct. And seeing you lead that show and 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 the part, my, what's the fucking character's name? The chairman. The chairman. Yeah. You're the MC of the night. You're the welcome to the fucking show guy. And you've got a few songs throughout, but you're really kind of holding the bookends of the play for the audience and holding their hand. And seeing you do that, I think was the first time I truly saw you in what I I knew then, and I can see it now in the work you're doing on like social, in that element of a lot of actors, I feel like they they do great work but there's not there's not a direct comfortability with looking at the audience and saying you come with me do c- come on this journey and and that's not appropriate for every role every mm-hmm. show but i feel like if you asked a lot of actors you might be very talented talk right to these people and deal with them the way a comic would or the way uh, any live stage performer that acknowledges the audience there would be kind of a barrier there it's like no just let me play the part over here and do that you had no problem at all standing on the stage and being like, fucking welcome to the show. And and looking at finding individual people and being like, this guy's hat. You know, whatever the fuck was going on and calling it out. I was, I was sure when I saw you in that show, I was like, if this guy's not immediately on like on Broadway or taking off in the more conventional way, I really saw you doing comedy, like stand-up. Like I was like, because you have that ability to connect with the people who are literally in the room. And that's not a skill that it's not something they taught us how to do at school. That's not part of acting training at all is like working with the audience and engaging with them in a really direct way. You seem to take to that immediately. Like that seemed to be something that just made sense to you. Did you always feel that like desire to cross the barrier? Have you been oh. in other shows where you're like, I wish I could just reach out and touch them? Or oh my God, yeah. Can't get my eyes off that bitch's wig. Like, are we going to say is, something? That's the easiest thing in the world for me. I'm like, like it is much harder for me to, to, to it has historically been, in my past, it's been harder for me to connect one-on-one in scenes. Like I felt very, um, it was hard for me to open up and to trust myself that I could be myself that way. But I knew if I had a crowd 
Mm. Oh, I got you all. I can I with the flick of a wrist. Yeah. I was like, I can, I can, can like I I got you all. Right. You know, and I, it's my favorite thing is just to electrify a group of people. And I and it just it literally does come naturally. And Edwin, it's funny you should say that. Edwin Drew was the first time in my life that I looked at a script and the character that I was supposed to play was exactly me. I yep. was like, this is something I can exactly do. I was like, I know exactly how I'm going to do You had this. it from the first day of rehearsal, I man. showed up completely off book, and the entire second act is basically his monologue. Right. A nonstop yeah. paced monologue. And I was like, I'm coming in completely off book, well, so and I have room to play. There's actually, not only that, for people who don't know the show, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, it's not just to play within a play throughout the night. The second act requires you to not just engage with the audience, but they get to pick the way the fucking play ends. Yeah. So the mystery of Evan Drude was a book by Charles Dickens. Right. And it's they didn't a, get it's finished. A, yes. It's the ultimate murder mystery. It's the one of the greatest writers of the English language writes a murder mystery and he died before he finished it. Right. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. So what there a is way no, to go. There is no answer. And there so, is no answer. So so the so the plot of the musical is this this group of Victorian music hall performers decide to put on a musical version of a Dickens book about murder that doesn't have an ending. And yeah. they're like, and you, the audience, are just gonna pick the murderer. Yeah. And like, and the audience actually votes. Yeah. They vote for the murderer, they vote for like a pair of lovers, they vote for somebody to be someone else. And it's really fun because it's actually real. Yeah. And there's a million different endings and a million different possibilities based on all these different characters. And, and all the actors have to learn all the endings and they're standing backstage yeah. waiting to see who gets to go out and be like, I'm the murderer. Right. And I was on stage the entire show. Right. The entire show. I never went backstage. That's also how John directed the yeah. play with the the backstage areas were included on stage. Brilliant. And so even when you left stage as your Drood character, your music hall character was like still there, like on the side waiting to go on. Right. You, and they very were like, few people left the stage permanently unless no. they were doing like a costume change yeah. or something like that. And then they were like smoking cigarettes and having drama off stage. It was yeah. hysterical. Um, or like, you know, like somebody on a on a stationary bike with a rope attached to it, pretending to turn the turntable. Like it Which was, was fully automated. So hysterical. Yeah. Um, it was a brilliant idea by John Langs. Um, but yeah, so so like the, I didn't know who the murderer would be every night because right. I was I found out when the audience did, but but it, it it is not fake. If you ever see a production of the mystery of Edwin Drew, yeah, it's not staged it at not, all in that way. It is it is not fixed. It is not fixed, and it's right. really, really fascinating the way that they constructed that. In America these days, though, someone will call it fraudulent. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I'm sure. So, someone will say it was unfair and yeah. the winner didn't win. Someone on the internet <laughs> said yeah. what they say. It's no, don't tell me. It doesn't matter. We have to take it seriously. What's cool, though, <laughs> is with that play is you end up with people who come back because they want, they hope, and they want to see the other endings of the show. Yeah. Which is really fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fun. So you you did this play, your senior? Senior year, yeah. Senior year. You get to do this show you said was like, the first time that you immediately connected with the part, no barrier between you and the character. Did you not, like I'm saying, I really thought maybe this guy's going to do stand up just because I've been a stand up nerd my whole life. And going to School of the Arts, there's very few people who come out of that school and do comedy specifically. Uh, Ashley Austin Morris, Brett Gelman, like there's a few people who have gone into stand up. Um, I've done some uh, and ran a club for a little while that hey. I'm wearing on my shirt. Um, but it's it's not a while there were comedy classes and there were comedy shows, improv, stand up, that world of comedy, it was not taught to us directly. And yet you seem to have brought some of that skill before you came, but definitely honed it while you were there. Was there a thought when you left school of trying that or going into that that specific genre? Absolutely not. That's crazy I, to me. I, well, I mean, you're I I um I started out. I've always, I would say I've always been a ham since I was a piglet, okay? Um, so I've always just been this over-the-top guy who, like, would always be doing impressions and blah, 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 just, like, sure. just a complete manic, you know, golden retriever. And, but, uh, but then I fell into dance. So I really... You are a tremendous dancer. So I was always like, I'm going to be on stage. But then I really fell in love with ballet and tap dancing and jazz. And then, you know, I went to a high school for the arts. Right. And... I went in as a, you had to declare a major and I went in as a double major in modern dance and acting. Cause I wanted to do Shakespeare and things like that too. 
Um, and then they discovered that I, you know, they're like, this is a high school for the arts and there's a boy who can dance musical theater. And then yeah. I found out I could sing and yeah. I can really sing. So then it became this track of like, oh, you're going to, you need to go to Broadway. You need to be in musical theater. You need to do that. And so you start shaping your identity around that and where you're going to go on a trajectory. I think it was a lot of them telling you who you were in a way, but you saying that makes sense. It made sense because right. I wanted to, I loved singing, I loved dancing and I loved acting. Yeah. And I was like, well, great. This is where things are going. And so then I only auditioned for musical theater schools, except for School of the Arts. Mm -hmm. And I just threw that in there at the last second because I was like, well, it's in-state tuition. Like, that is I don't so know. many people's yeah. story. And I don't know how much you know that, but doing this show for so long, I can tell you, because it's not, it, it's different now. Now we're a little bit more famous as a school than <laughs> we were even just like 20 years ago, back when we were thinking about where we were going to go. Yeah. Because of some of the people who have really popped off. Um, but for so many people, the school was like a, ah, let's throw it in there. Right. Well, I, I, I live in North give Carolina and right, it's of course. In state tuition and people in North Carolina don't realize how good it is in their, this school is in their backyard. And it's about a 70% discount on tuition. Exactly. Yeah. But, but they act like if it's not in the mentality there, it's kind of like, if, well, if it's not in New York or LA, it's not legit. And right. that, that couldn't be further from the truth because of other schools around the country that aren't there and especially of one that's in your own backyard. And once yeah. I saw productions there, I was like, holy crap. Yeah. These people can act. And I was like, I want, I don't want to be in the chorus. I want to be an actor and I want to have something to do when I, when my dancing knees go, Right, you know? So I went to school of the arts and then in my mind, I'm still thinking I'm going to do musical theater right. with all of this. Cause I kept up the singing and I kept up the dancing. And people often are like, it's not an empty program, but I mean, God damn, if it doesn't give you most of what you need, it's, if you have it in you to do musical theater as your career, you're going to get what you need from school of the arts. You truly. really are. And you're probably going to emerge a better actor than a lot of MT programs. Cause maybe you're not getting as much like ballet or tap or whatever, like the other pieces, but the acting training, which is a lot of what musical theater actors don't end up sharpening quite as much because yeah. the singing is so much well, of a I thing. I mean, if you're looking at like a college program as something that needs to prepare you to be for employment in the real world, a right. musical theater program is by nature going to try to train you for, frankly, the chorus as much as possible, which is right. mostly focused on singing and dancing Yeah, with very few lines because yeah. that's where the most jobs are, literally. Yeah. There's just more jobs in there. But it there. does feel like training to be an extra. Yeah, but it's so these are the most talented extras in the world. They don't stand sure. in the background. They do sure. backflips into s splits, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I'm too cerebral to find, personally, to have found that kind of... Uh, yeah. And I've done background work. I've done extra work mm -hmm. and I've been, um, around these people that you're talking about that like the best. Um, and I, I get it. And if you're, if you're, if you're a singer and you're a dancer and that's what you're most excited about for sure. But if you really love acting, I can't imagine chorus being satisfying. No. For you. And I, and I didn't want to do that. And I knew that I knew what I was didn't quite fit that mold. Right. You know? And so I think I've been, and, and yet what I was graduating school at 22 also didn't fit the mold. I yeah. didn't fit the musical theater mold of someone who isn't in the chorus. Cause basically it's like, are you a jawline with vibrato? Right. Right. Then get, then get out yeah. until you're 50. You yeah. know, um, I was just talking to Joshua Morgan about that recently. There are Him very few character roles Brian in musical Suto, theater. And when you're 22 yes. and you're a character actor or you're, you know, whatever you want to call it, if you, I mean, what is a 22 year old character actor supposed to do? Exactly. You can count on one hand uh, for men and women, the, probably the roles, the, the roles for people who aren't essentially a leading man or leading lady. Yeah. On, on one hand. You it's can the count same on thing hand. as a directing was, student yeah. at that age, because no one is like, let's give this 23 year old director a of shot. Course. Like I, I've said this a million times. I, I knew upon graduating school, I, I said out loud a million times. I was like, I know. My 20s are gonna suck. You knew it then? I knew it. Did they? I Yes. It was <laughs> awful. <laughs> it was fun because life is fun and sure. I'm fun. But and like, you're running around it, New York. You're, you're working. Oh, but... I worked nonstop. There was right. a point I had six jobs at one time and wow. no health insurance. I was in three shows at once, including an off-Broadway 
I was starring in a huge hit off Broadway production, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. I was bottom. My bottom was open to the public for eight weeks only. Um, <coughs> <laughs> and um, and then I was in this like uh, I had a weekly comedy show at Alan Cummings Nightclub, and like Kesha would come see us. And it was weekly just, comedy show. Yeah. What does this mean? I, it was a cabaret show where a, uh, a comedy partner and I in New York. I, I slowly fell into comedy. You did end up so much. Great. Let me let me go back. Please. Okay. I knew my 20s were going to suck. Right. And they kind of did. Right out of the gate, I did a lot of really cool things. I um, uh, And I booked my dream show. My dream show was not a Broadway show. What was it? Was it was an off-Broadway show called Forbidden Broadway, which is a parody show parodying Broadway. It's like Saturday Night Live for Broadway. And they oh, updated it all the time. And I, very long... Oh, it's kind of a school of the arts story. Maybe I should tell it. I Go mean, ahead. Okay. So how I booked this is freaking amazing. It's yeah. wild. So this was my dream show since I was a high school student. You'd already known about this production. Yes. So I I was so I went to a public high school for the arts. And sure. I got it. I that's when I first started discovering musical theater. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like the really deep, cool stuff. And uh, really serious operatic things like Les Mis and Ragtime. And I was like, oh, right, this right. is awesome. And my friend was like, have you heard of Forbidden Broadway? And I was like, what's that? And he's like, well, it's this parody show that's been running for like forever and they update it all the time. And he played me, he burned me a CD, aging myself, um, <laughs> with uh, of of the, the tracks. And I died laughing. Right. It's so funny. Like, that's how I felt about Complete Works of Shakespeare Abridged. Yeah. Which I well, I directed at school, but I'd already done it in high school mm -hmm. because when I found Shakespeare in high school, I was like, this is hilarious. Then senior year, they're like, do you know there's this thing where three guys run around with wigs doing everything he wrote in two hours? I was yeah. like, <laughs> let's go. Totally. Yeah. And I, was I relate like, to I'm, that. I'm such a character. I'm such a com comedian and and like such a ham. I, I, I really wanted to, I was like, this is what I want to do. And I said right there when I was 15, I was like, I want that to be the first show I do when I get to New York. And while I was in college, the show closed. For Fuck. The, it, had, it had not closed since like 1980. You know, you, you, it, was, it was like, oh my God, but like the uh, long story. Right, right. Um, and I was like, oh, my dream. Right. No. Withering on the vine. Well, cut to whatever year end. We had a guest teacher named Laura Henry. Sure. And she's this amazing acting coach and amazing acting teacher. And she casually mentioned in class something about like, my friend Jerry Allison Drini, like blah, 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 blah. And I was like, wait, I, let me interrupt class. Do you mean Gerard Allison Drini, the writer and creator of Forbidden Broadway? And she's like, how do you know that? I was right. like, that's my dream. That's and my she's shit. like, well, he's, we're, he's my best friend. And I'm like, what? And so I, I just couldn't believe that. I was like, oh my God, my hero, you know? Sure. Cut to two years later, I'm graduating. The month that we are graduating, there's a notice in Playbill, Forbidden Broadway is coming back and they're holding auditions. And I emailed Laura Henry. That's I some kismet shit, dude. Yes, I was like, you know I'm right for this. You know so many ways that I can do all these impressions and I can sing all that stuff because Forbidden Broadway, they have to sing the real notes, yeah. but in a parody voice. Like, it's really hard. Can you give me the email fingers one more time? Email fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. And, and and she was like, okay, calm down, queen. Um, right. She was like, here's his address. You know, here you go. So I sent, I hand-delivered to Gerard Alessandrini's doorman a... Uh, headshot resume and a cover letter being like, you don't know me. I don't have an agent. I am perfect for this. I promise if you give me audition, I'm going to book it. And he gave me an audition. They wanted like five impressions. I gave them seven. The second round, I get a call back. What did you do? Oh my God, everything. I, um, I, well, my song that I went in with for just me, I did, I've got you under my skin by Cole Porter. Okay. But I did it like I was tied to a chair trying to escape the room. <laughs> Did you come up with that? Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> and so it was It was amazing. Um, and then, like, I just did all these diff different impressions of, like, like Avi Feinstein, we would do, you know, or, yeah. or like, um, who else did I do? I don't know. Who else did I do? Um, uh, maybe, like, Brian Stokes Mitchell yeah. from Ragtime. Yeah. Who became my neighbor later. Um, well, anyway. Small world. So, like, I went through round and round of audition and always gave them more than they asked for. 
And then, uh, long story short, that became, well, that was not a long story short. What am I saying? <laughs> oh, I'm actually cutting some stuff out. <laughs> um, we can do the I booked the show and my, in, what became the first show I did when I moved to New York. Dude. It was, it was like. That's amazing. That's an amazing story, right? That is really good. And I didn't know that at all. I didn't know that you, I mean, it's so tough, right? Because people do like showcase or whatever, and then they just take off. And especially the people who are above you at school, you're still like in it. So it's hard to start tracking unless it's like shows up on TV or something like that. And you see it immediately. I didn't know that story at all, dude. That's fucking amazing. It was so cool. It was, it was like literally kismet. You know, how I would never you, have booked that if I hadn't gone to school of the arts. How long did you get to do that show? Uh, six months, I think. Holy um, shit. That's a good then run. I, then I fell in with them because they keep doing, they keep updating updates, the show. Right. And they, he writes other parody shows. So I did like a Nutcracker parody with him at Lincoln Center. Um, I did uh, a, I did Spamilton, which was his Forbidden Broadway version of a parody of Hamilton. Sure. Absolutely brilliant. I played King George. It was so fun. Um, that was a princess part. I had one song in the first act, one song in the second, and I got the biggest applause of the night. <laughs> Those are the best, dude. It was great. Those are the parts that make me want to get back into acting. I'm like, just give me King Herod. Oh, fabulous. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's the, that's the way to go. I yeah. never heard that term princess part before. Is that what yeah. that's called? Yeah, that's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> you just sit backstage like, go ahead. Y'all well, keep singing for two hours. Well, that doesn't sound like sucky twenties to me, man. Well, it was, I, I, I booked all this stuff and other things by busting my ass. Sure. I could not get lucky. You know, I couldn't get anybody to, any agent to really get me any auditions. Would you have traded it for that? For luck? Yeah, because luck gives you money. Luck gets you to the next level. I was sort of hovering at the top of the off-Broadway heap, you know, and the nightclub scene in New York for 10 years. I was like always right there and getting huge reviews by like the New Yorker and like all this stuff. Right. And getting this kind of underground following, but I couldn't break through to the next level because I literally couldn't get in the room for any of the big casting directors. But do you think that you would have built like this social media following and all of this hard work if you hadn't been busting your ass your whole 20s and like really sharpening skills like no, that? No, I wouldn't have had to. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I, I, yeah, I all guess. Of this is, everything that I've done has been, frankly, because of necessity. Because it was like, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit on my butt. Like I'm going to keep, that's I'm not keep something working. I ever thought you would do. No, I wasn't I'm worried like, about that. If I've got downtime, I'm working on something, you know, yeah, that's what I'm I the same a writer way. as well. It's fucking doing yeah. this shit. No one's paying me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I get, I, the only reason I challenge it is just because I think of, you know, I think of the things that I've done in my own career. And I'm like, there are times when I wish someone would have just been like, you know what, kid, here's the thing. I've, I've, I recognize you, I see you mm -hmm. and here's the thing that you've wanted, or here's the thing that's going to put you wherever. And there are definitely days when I'm like, not disappointed, but I'm like, man, what would it be like if I had done this or gotten that and took off on that path or whatever? But I don't know that I'd trade it for the, the grit of fucking working my ass off without anyone telling me to do it. Like, I, I wanted that, especially in my 20s. I mean, dude, that's how I got into School of the Arts. I was not fucking, had no reason to be accepted into that program. The only reason I got into the drama school is because I directed a show with the seniors and, and, and got cast in a directing project, all of which I was like, hey, Jerry, look at this. You know, it, it wasn't a like right out of high school. I'm the best dude at my local high school. And now I'm going on to a great school. Like so many people have that story. And so I, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to trade it for all the time that I busted my ass out of necessity. Like I wouldn't want that taken from me. And I, I, I imagine that's got to give you something. Well, I'm very proud of what I did because every, every, Should be. every time I was given a challenge, I was like, I've exceeded it. You know, and, yeah. like, and I would keep, I was doing so many things that all, all of this was happening like on top of each other at the same time. Right. I was in, you know, three shows at once at one point and also working two day jobs and, um, like w writing an opera, <laughs> you know, right. and, um, uh, but, but, you know, th yeah, like, but, but I, I've always wanted to work on, on a, at a really high level. And I just, I was very frustrated that I literally could not get a chance to be rejected before that high level, you know, sure. it was like, like I, there was, it just became a point of like, there's literally nothing more I can do, 
you know, there's but nothing do you, to do to change But do this. you think, like, for example, uh, Paris Through the Window, right? Yeah. Do you think you would have written that if you were, like, a regular on a series at the time? I, I actually did, yes. that's I started that while my, my acting career was, like, hot in a big way. When okay. I first got out of school and I was, like, a young... Twinkie dancer, <laughs> like you know, like like I was like fucking and like doing all these things. I was in a show that was supposed to go to Broadway. Then it's going to Broadway now. Great, um, <laughs> yeah, um, without me for them, yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, like that's when I started. That's when I started writing because my whole life, as long as I've wanted to be an actor and a performer, I've also always had this other creative side to me. The whole time on the side, I was always right. directing something or choreographing or designing or filming or whatever. And I wanted to keep, even while I was at school, like when I had downtime at school, I'd be directing like Sunset Boulevard in the drama gym. Right. Like it was, I, I'm just crazy. I remember Sunset Boulevard. It was a mess, but <laughs> it I wasn't mean, a mess. What am I saying? It was really cool. It was pretty good, um, dude. But, uh, uh, Anyway, I wanted to keep that up once I got to New York. And I was right. like, well, getting people in a room in New York is really expensive and hard to do. Sure. So I was like, well, maybe I can try writing. And then I realized, like, I kind of had a talent for it, but I needed to get a lot better at it. So that's how that started. And then writing really took over my life for most of my mid-20s. Um, and that was was kind of what was happening. I was writing an opera that was kind of in every English language newspaper in the world for a minute. Yeah. I wrote a musical. I wrote a children's musical. I And then I started falling into comedy in the nightclub scene because of uh, my off-Broadway shows and the people right. I met there. They're like, hey, come do this show with me. And then I had a weekly club act and then I had a monthly off-Broadway show. And it was just, so I was doing way too many things at once. Sure. And not really getting at the, uh, not not really getting any help or not not getting seen or respected even when I was literally right up against the the biggest people in the industry like I was also working for the biggest producers on Broadway at the same time as their assistants right and like you just you were just kind of like the help yeah you know it was so it was it was a really hard time i i worked my butt off yeah really really hard um so that's what made it hard. I'm very proud of the success I had, but it was a really, really, really hard struggle to do all of that completely on my own. Well, it's very impressive to watch from a distance, man. I have Thank to say, you. as someone, you know, we've always been friends, but not like super close. We don't really like keep in touch on a regular basis. And in now, that experience is very much through social media. It's very much through kind of seeing like, oh, they're in that story or they're in that post. Like, what are they, is that person up to? Which is fully filtered by what people choose to tell everybody that they're yeah. doing. Um, and I have to say that as someone who has always respected your talent and always really, dude, just been entertained by you. And that's, that's one of the things I'm not just trying to kiss your ass and we can turn the cameras off soon <laughs> and do that. But, um, it's, it, you're one of the people that at school, like I said, when I was watching you like in Drood or when I was watching you in anything on stage and I would, I would hear what you were in or, or in, uh, this play and, and Charles is going to be that part. I would be like, fuck yes. Like I can't wait to watch it because I, I found you just a captivating person. And when you say that when you're on stage and you can kind of grab a hold of the audience, I, you're fucking right. I mean, you know what I don't have to tell you, but as a member of that audience more than once, especially with Drew, I fucking watched the whole thing from start to finish. I watched it every goddamn night. I didn't feel that way about everybody at school. You know, I wouldn't say I felt that way about the majority of people at school. There were people whose talent I respected that I still wasn't entertained by every time I saw them. And so when I see people like that and I see you go off and do your thing and whatever attention you get, I am so happy for you because I am so... I know what it's like to sit in the front row and have you point to me and make me feel like I'm at the show. And I want to give that to everybody because it's, dude, it's special as fuck. Thank and you. not everyone can do that. Thank and you. so hearing that you're, whether it's in the nightclub scene or whatever you get up to out here in LA, as far as that goes, and I really fucking think you should try stand up and we can talk more about that. Uh, yeah, I've, um, I've done but, it. Have you really? Yeah, I won a stand up. I won. I started. What? I won a stand up competition at the comedy store in London. Um, Dude, what fucking? Can we thank high you. five? Thank you. That's fucking awesome. And then, like, I was a final or a semi finalist in the New York Queer Comedy Festival this year, but then I, I was 
I was too busy and I couldn't go to the, go to the, go to the finals. <laughs> that is fucking insane. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just sort of started. Somebody, this guy, Drew Tessier, who's an amazing, or Tessier, who's an, an awesome, like, queer comedy curator in New York sure. City, found me online. I was like, hey, I really think you should try stand up. And I, was I like, reached out to you when okay. I was running the club, if yeah. you remember. And I was like, dude. I don't, I don't even know what your act is. I was already like trying to book you at the club, not even <laughs> knowing you were doing standup. I was like, I will, I will get you down here to Texas. I think you will crush in Austin, Texas, like nobody's business. They would love you, which is still true. I'm not there anymore, but I'm telling you, if you get a chance to go to Austin, they would fucking love you there. It, I, I knew it too. A hundred percent. I'm so excited to I, hear that. It's, it's so, it's, I, I've kind of done everything. That's true. <laughs> and and it's 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 hard for me to to feel like I find a place where I really fully fit. Because pro so... wrestling is next, I assume. Why not? Yeah? I mean, <laughs> you've got the jacket. Hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> that would you be ready sick. to feel some pain, boy. Are you guys seeing this? This is what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> That's amazing, dude. So, okay, well, let's talk about the social media thing. So when, I mean, you, uh, you've been putting stuff out as far as like, a, you know, here's my creative journey for a long time. Yeah. But as far as being inter an entertainer on the platform of social media, yeah. TikTok, Instagram, when did that kind of start? When did it pick up steam and what's it been like? During the pandemic. Got um, it. So we're all at home. I use the pandemic because I was like, oh, I'm, I can get these writing projects done. So I was like, I'm going to finish a miniseries and a movie and a pilot. Right. And do was, it all at once. I did so much work. And then um, people were like, you really need to get on TikTok because that's the right. things that I do on TikTok is literally just like me walking around the house and it pops into my head. And like, I would, that's just how I am. My brain Great is platform that manic. for that. And, um, and people were like, you would be so entertaining on there. I think people would really like you. And I was like, I don't really like social media because I would always invest a lot of time in big, long videos that wouldn't get a lot of views because I couldn't produce at that level consistently enough to feed the algorithm, feed the beast. Yep. So it was, it was kind of frustrating for me. Um, and I, I just didn't really do, I didn't really use social media that much, uh, even as a, as a user. And then people were like, you really got to get on TikTok. You really got to get on TikTok. You'd be perfect. And I was like, okay. So I got a TikTok and I did a couple things. At and then, the right time. Right. And there was this trend that was going around. There was when when Gen Z was discovering that dream song by, by Fleetwood Mac. And everybody right. was lip syncing and it went to the top of the charts. I found that kind of funny. So I was like, I did a, I was like, well, let me post something like that. And so I used the the dreams audio and I did this, this skit that was like, um, uh, Gen X mom and a, with a Gen Z I daughter. Remember that. Yeah, and the Gen Z daughter's like, Mom, I, TikTok just came out with the best new song. And she's like, Yeah, sweetie. And then they just listen. And it's Fleetwood Mac. Right. And the mom's smile just slowly fades. fades yeah. And the daughter goes, It's by that girl from American Horror Story. And the mom just like slaps her. And the wig head just goes <laughs> flying. And it got like 2 million views overnight. And I, my biggest frustration is not being able to get seen by a, a wider audience or by the higher ups in this business. Just I could not draw an audience. I could not draw attention in that way. And all of a sudden I had it. And I was like, I am not letting this go. Yeah. So I posted, no matter what was going on, I posted at least one video every day for 365 days. And they weren't just like, here's my selfie or me. Doing You're trying things. to it create like, something valuable. It was, it was a three act play every day. Right. That was my. That was what I told myself. It's a three act play every day. You got to get a beginning, middle, and end in you know fifteen seconds. Right. You know, or two minutes. You know, however yeah. long the yeah. video was. I was in the hospital that year. I po I found a way to post. I was in. I had a funeral from uh, a high school lover and friend. I still found a way to post. Not at the funeral. I'd like right. back. <laughs> I had things like stocked up. We got to milk everything but, you can. But I was like, I'm not giving this. I, I, it, it's such a valuable tool and it's completely changed my life. It's afforded me opportunities and auditions that I never could have gotten otherwise. Yep. I've had auditions for Netflix, Universal, NBC, um, uh, s some new network that's coming out. Um, like every, there's so many and I've booked things and pilots and, uh, TV shows from that, just yeah. exclusively from that. It's completely changed my life. And it's starting to get me the things that I've been wanting to get this whole time. It's, it's such a weird, like it's, it's such a weird time. You and I came 
came of age. We we left school at a time when social media was in its nascent stage and people weren't right. really using it like to make money. There wasn't really an influencer it was economy. For fun. It was just kind of a thing. Yeah. And all of that changed under our feet. And now it's almost expected of you that that's what you do more than anything else. Right. It's fascinating and kind of a weird adjustment for me. Well, honestly. the thing the thing about it is and that a lot of people don't understand and what what I don't want to even say bums me out because I hear you say this and I uh, about like producing a lot of content that doesn't get digested and kind of being like, why am I making it? Like, what's the yeah. point? Um, it's one of the reasons why I don't do theater anymore. Why I left it so early to go into television because I was bummed because I was like, no one ever, I don't want to beg 30 people to come out to Brooklyn to see a thing that I worked on for fucking four months. I, it's going to break my heart yeah. to know that like nine people are ever going to talk to me about that one thing I did. Try working on the same theater script for nine years. Oh, dude, I can't imagine. <laughs> the disappointment there. I'm like, can well, anybody? <laughs> well, you say try and I say no. I, <laughs> I, I fucking don't. I didn't want to do that. And and so many of my colleagues and friends out of my class, and that was their journey. And I respect it because I do think such great work gets made in that way. But I have two minds about it, right? I'm like right now I work on a, a TV show that I've been on for a couple of years. I mean, I've been doing producing TV shows for a few years, but I've been on one show for about two years and it's on TLC and it gets millions of views every week that it's on. Are they casting really weird people? Cause look at me. Are you looking to marry someone from out of the country? Yeah. If they're hot. God. All right. I'll see what we can do. <laughs> um, so it's uh, no, but I've been working reality TV. That's what I, that's what I do. I just did a reality show. Did you really? I can't say what it is. But. Okay. Well, not, and I can't talk about mine too much. So we'll, yeah, okay. we'll, 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 we'll mute keep. that for a second. But I, I've found that working on that content specifically, like kind of when I started, I started on a few different random shows, but the first show that I really worked on that was like being watched was dancing with the stars. And I did six oh. seasons with them. And every single Monday night of that show, when it's on, it's like, a half a Super Bowl's worth of people watching it. Like it's, it's so well, not every Monday that much, but for the season, it ends up being that much. It's, it's got millions of people with their eyeballs on it and doing that work allows me to not give a shit as much when I do my, this stuff. And then, you know, a hundred people watch it or listen to it. I had to separate the two. It had to be like I need I need that fuel where the eyeballs are there. So if if I'm just constantly working all the time on something that no one's paying any attention to, I'll quit. But if I can also make my money on the thing that's got the eyeballs, then I'm free to make a play, make a short film, make a podcast, make a thing that maybe people see, maybe they don't. I want to have fucking fun making it because I think often about how much fun I had at school at like intensive arts or Edwin Drood or whatever the fuck. And I'm like, how many people saw that shit? Like nobody. And I had a blast and I didn't walk away from it. Like nobody saw my intensive arts thing. Only those 150 people in Catawba or whatever. It was, I didn't even give a fuck that anybody saw it. I'm glad people saw it and I got some claps and that was good. And maybe they laughed and that's fun. But more than that, I, I don't look back on everyone's laughter during the show. I look back on the rehearsals. I look back on the process of the creation that gets me excited and makes me feel like I did something. It's got to be both, but for me, it's okay to be separate. And I love, love, love that for you, first of all, that it's, it's not totally separate, that you've got your eyeballs on the stuff that you're putting your time into and creating. And it's well-deserved, man, because I, I am... I am deeply entertained by the stuff that you're making. Thank you. What's funny is that like that is like a in a way a side a side hustle for me. Like I mm. my that's like not my focus right, in my of life. Course. And people don't realize that because that's all they know me for. Exactly. And then I'm like, I'm literally like I spent six years researching, just researching a mini series about the French Revolution and, and uh Marie Antoinette that I that I then wrote finally during the pandemic. Like these are the things that I do. And I'm right. I just finished writing this musical that took nine years, um, Paris through the window. That's absolutely gorgeous. We're finalizing the album right now. We're hoping to put it on out you know, on all platforms soon. Um, like the congratulations. I'm, thank you. And like, I, I write, uh, amazing like comedies and like all this stuff. Like I really want to, you know, work in, in what I was trained to do, like as, as, as a comedic actor and, yeah. and a comedic writer. Um, 
And that's where I my identity and my focus is. And it's just fascinating that like I, I and all the 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 all the like thousands of hours and that you're you're working on this all yep. the time. And then and then I've also got to do the social media thing every day. And I'm also doing that and it's just like keep right. trying to feed the beast and keep up with that. But 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 like I'm really focusing on these huge mountains I've had to climb because they're they're truly creative mountains. And these are the things that I sort of identify myself as. And then everybody else is like, Darth, <laughs> Mrs. Darth Vader, like Jennifer Coles. I'm like, what? I'm like, right. But like, you know, this thing about Mark Chagall and dead babies during World War I. And they're like, yeah. no, do an impression, put on a wig. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's wonderful. But it's, it's, it's take, it took me a long time to adjust to the fact that behind all these views are like people. Because right. I feel like I'm shouting in a shoebox. I'm of like, course. I'm just doing it at home. And I'm like, I post it and like occasionally interact. But, you know, then I I started getting recognized all the time in New York. Right. And people stopping and taking, taking pictures with me. And I get recognized in West Hollywood all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's really. And suddenly like, wait, this is like real. Do you know what my theory it's on weird. that is as far as like how it changes? Because, again, I'm going to drop uh, Joshua Morgan's name because I was talking to him about this exact thing the other day. You know, he mentioned when I did his episode, he was like, I struggle to remind people I'm an actor because I started No Rules Theater Company or I did, or he's doing artist strategy and starting these businesses and doing these other projects. And he's like, my own close peers, my friends, my classmates from school are like, so you're still acting? And it's like, fucking yes. Like, Ouch, a little, yeah. like, because I feel like it's crazy that you would even assume that I wasn't still doing it. And Josh was booked plenty of stuff. I mean, TV, Broadway. I mean, the dude, the dude is still very much doing that work, but I think in this oversaturation of media and content and shit that's out there, the thing that you're the loudest about is going to be your thing. I mean, I think about all the people, for example, something that's going on right now, and I'll get to the, the point I'm making about my theory of the whole thing. Evan Peters just played Dahmer in this new series that's like really big. Mm -hmm. Evan Peters has been crushing in acting from American Horror Story and all these different things for like over a decade. I've known who he is. I've known he's incredibly talented. Everybody's going to call him the Dahmer guy for like five years unless he books something else really fucking big. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things where people are so their mind is so busy with so much shit that they're like, I really, really, I love you, but I need to put you in one box. Of course. You need to just be in one box and I respect your talent, but until you make a thing that's bigger than the box I have you in now, mm -hmm. that's, that's who you are. You're the Jennifer Coolidge guy. Exactly. And I'm don't mean to sound like ungrateful at all. I think uh, and it's, you don't. I love it. I, you like, don't. I love the people that I've been able to meet from this and the people, the, 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 the the messages I get and the uh, one of my favorite things is I have I, I'm on Cameo which you have to be invited on it's like celebrities only I didn't know you were on Cameo yes they invited me and they're like you want to do this and so like I make money uh, people get personalized yeah. videos for me and it's my favorite thing because like it's like they they're like can you do this 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 and this and I'm like right. yes it's like how can I make your day? Yeah. I get to make your day exactly the way you want me to. Yeah. And I love it. And it's characters that I've created in a way, like the Jennifer Coolidge thing is like my weird take on her. It's like not, it's like this, it's turned into this completely like surrealist. Like, and you haven't met her yet, right? No. And I would love to. Oh my God. Um, that video, you think oh my 2 God. million is a lot? I Wait until Jen meets Jen. Well, did you see, <laughs> okay, recently- Beyonce put me in her first TikTok. Excuse me? Yes. That went that what? morning. I put a bagel on a credit card. I was so dang poor. People were like, you're a success. You're a success. Like every it like blew up. And like suddenly, like I got like a hundred thousand followers overnight. First of all, and you I should pay like for everything on a credit card. It's a liability <laughs> issue. Don't use your debit card, folks. There's some financial <laughs> advice. I know you asked for it, and that's why you're on at the elephants, was for the financial advice. <laughs> Always use a credit card. Because see, if they steal money from you on the debit card, you can't get it back. The credit card, you can dispute the charges. Go on. I don't think the bagel place was running that kind of operation yeah but, but you never know you never was, know it was just so funny the the, the <laughs> comedy the juxtaposition i was like i'm so desperately poor that i can't i'm gonna have to charge the bagel and then, and then beyonce puts me on her tiktok like right then what was the tiktok 
It was it was a compilation of fan videos dancing around or doing something okay. to her new single, Break My Soul. And this Got was it. her first time joining TikTok. Right, right. So it was literally like I was on CNN was mentioning me and like all it was amazing. like everywhere. And it was fast. It was amazing. It was like, ah, pff, like and you uh, want to be like, I I've written musicals, but it, and just, it's totally <laughs> fine. Like who cares? Like right. that's amazing. Like, that's really cool, like, man. I know. I'm like, it's so cool. And, and, and I posted about this being like, I'm so poor. I just put a bagel on a credit card. Y'all this is hilarious. And my fans started sending me money. Like somebody sent me $50 and being like for the next bagel. I'm like, mm, that's going to be a nice ass bagel. 50 bucks. Yes. You're, you, you might even get a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's so cool. And like I said, I, it's not just joy for you in your success. Cause I, I'm unlimited in that, but joy for your audience, because I know what it's like to be in the audience of someone who is really connecting with their crowd. I mean, there's a lot of people, like I said, I kind of went over this, but glossed over it earlier. Not every actor or every performer is is engaging or connecting with the audience in a direct way. And it doesn't mean they're not talented. You know, uh, the, yeah, just talked about Evan Peters. He yeah. did amazing work on a, on a film set. There was not a crowd there other than the crew that he was connecting with directly. And I don't, maybe he would be great on stage or maybe he would be great in, in a live setting or, or a, you know, I don't think he's, he's like doing social media content, but like, that's a very specific skill set. And it's one of those things of like, I've had a bunch of jobs in my life where I was doing the job and I found out very quickly, mostly in production and TV, this has happened. I took the job being like, I can't believe I get to work at Comedy Central or I can't believe I get to work on this TV show. And I do the job for like a month, two months, three months, six months. And I'm like, I do not like this. <laughs> like, I don't like this every yeah. day. It sounded cool when I started, I'm not programmed for this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I quit Comedy Central, which I thought was going to be my dream gig. I thought I might do it for the rest of my life when I got that yeah. job. I couldn't believe they hired me. I told them seven months in, I'd like to quit in a few months, which is also not how you quit a job. Usually like I got to go and they're like, well, we got to replace you. But I knew the team was small and they needed to replace me and that wasn't going to be easy. So I was like, is it okay if I give you like a three month notice? And you guys start the process of interviewing and figuring out who's going to take my spot. And they were like, graciously, and I'll always be thankful of this. They said, yes. And they're like, you can keep working here until we replace you. But I quit fucking Comedy Central because I was sitting in a cubicle every day. And I was writing stuff that aired on television when I was like a year out of school. Like I couldn't fucking believe that I had that opportunity. But everything felt like a like I was playing a video game. It all felt like it was at a computer. I didn't, it didn't feel real. Like, and it was, but it wasn't because I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to write a thing down on a piece of paper and send it off to LA for Kevin Hart to read and then later get some footage back of him reading it. That's it wasn't good enough for me. I was like, I want to hand it to Kevin Hart and be like, mm -hmm. dude, say this and see him do it and go, Oh shit. All right. Try, try it this way. Like I wanted it to be a more direct connection. So I knew immediately it's not, it's not going to work out. And I can't believe I'm going to quit this thing and start somewhere else from zero, but I have to be true to what I'm good at and what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and right. to bring it back to the point that I'm making, I left that job saying, I hate leaving you guys, but I got to leave this job and whoever can do this job and not want to quit and love it every day, hire them. They should be doing the job. And my point as it relates to you is you engaging directly with an audience rather than just, or I should say, as well as making things screaming into a shoebox or whatever, yeah. <laughs> or making things for like nine years that you're not getting immediate feedback on. You should do that. But man, you have that skill set. You have you. that innate ability to immediately connect and engage with a crowd, with an audience, with people who are right in front of you. And truthfully, social media is that because you post it right away. It gets seen right away, or maybe it takes a day or two, but it's a closer thing than 
making a movie and waiting for nine months while it's in post for someone to hopefully catch it. Yes, like, of course. You're right there. The cameos. You're like, you want a thing? Send me what you want. Great. Here it is. It's it's there for you. And I'm so glad that you're doing that. And like I said, I'm even happier for the people who get to consume it because I know how great that feels. Thank you. Thank you. It's 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 been an incredible, it's literally completely changed my life, social media completely changed my life for the better. It's been really hard to do because it, right. is, it, it is it is way more work and way more hours than people actually realize. Oh, I'm sure. Um, and I also- I mean, I know. I, should, I say I'm sure. I fucking know exactly but, what but you like, mean. I also like try to hold myself to a very high standard because I'm like, this is also like kind of my audition tape for like my ability to write sketch comedy really at a really high level really quickly. So I try to keep my jokes smart, not just bah, 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 but like, right. s- like you look at the writing. If I'm, if I'm like in a wig or something, I'm, like, it's, I'm trying to be clever here. Like, but like, sometimes I just do things of me like walking around doing my life. But the shitty wig stuff. I know it's so bad. No, but you know, what's <laughs> great is that the, it's such great comedy because it's that juxtaposition of like, yeah, you're wearing this wig that looks like you've never brushed it or anything. I haven't. Great. And I know. <laughs> but I know that the time you didn't spend brushing the wig or making that look perfect went into the writing of the thing. Yes. And that's where the quality is. And it almost makes it even funnier that you're wearing it. If you were wearing a perfect wig, it wouldn't be fucking funny. Fully. Like this this is what Forbidden Broadway did. Like they they did a parody of the musical once. It was one of the best things they ever did. Um uh and once is all the actors play instruments. So the girl who plays the piano, they literally brought out an upturned this is an off-Broadway hit show. They bring out a, there's, and there's a real piano on the stage. Like a baby grand is on the stage, but for her to play the piano, they pull out a cardboard box that's overturned. And one of the flaps just has a piece of computer paper printed (laughs) out with the keys. And it just says piano written on it. And it was hysterical. Yeah. It's sometimes the low budget stuff makes it funnier. Right. Like it's, it's like South Park. You think, yeah, it's so low. It's so crudely done that it makes you laugh. It's what makes it brilliant. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say that I'm brilliant, but I mean like, I'll say it. You're that. brilliant. Thank you. For sure. I'm also, I'm a really bad homosexual. What does that mean? It means I don't know how to brush a wig <laughs> and it shows. I don't know how to brush a wig. I don't know how to do makeup. Like I'm like really bad at those things. Like at the visual, like I, I know how to dress. Okay? Sure. Yeah. But I don't know how to like maintain, you know, like I don't know how to, how to do, do any of this, uh, any of that stuff. So like, I'm just like, you know what? I'm not going to worry about it for social media. I'm going to worry about the things that I am good at. The writing, the co- the acting, you know, the editing sometimes, like the, the 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 beats of the editing. So How long start to finish does it take you to do an edition of drag names, for example? Really quick, and that's why I do so many of them. Because I can pound out. Because I'm busy. Love I love the I'm expression. Like, like it's, <laughs> um, you, you can, I can get like 10 of those done at once because I just stockpile them. I just stockpile right. them and I can do... I can film so many at once that then if I'm really busy one day and it's like post a clock, because with the algorithms, you kind of have to post at certain times to catch the the most followers now. Like it's teach really, a class on that. Oh yeah. It's a whole thing. Yeah. How so, did you figure that out? I don't mean I, to interrupt. I googled it, as Maya Rudolph would say. I Googled it. Um and just did a lot of research. I was like, I really gotta So the roadmap was out there and you just found it. Yeah, I had to, yeah. And then committed to producing at the rate that it was necessary. Totally, totally. Um, Yeah. So what what I love, dude, fucking drag names is one of my favorite things. I get so excited every time one pops up. What's your favorite? I can't fucking believe you've been doing it this long. (laughs) I I, I, I don't mean in disrespect. I'm like- yeah, I saw the other day and it was like drag names 41. I know, and I was like, 41. 41? It's amazing. Is that how fucking long this has but been going on? It kind of, I kind of, it's kind of like one of those things that like, I, it's Do you think- getting harder. So like, it's more, it's more impressive to me. It's, it's more like my own endurance going, like, how long can I keep this going without repeating? Is there a, cha- do you keep an overall list? Oh yes. I, of course you do. I have thousands of individual notes in my iPhone uh, for so many projects and drag names is just one of them. And there's like, I don't know how many I've done at this point. Um, my favorite, I think out of all the ones that I've done is Edith Ath. <laughs> <laughs> it's so That's good. So good. I, and I was telling you before we started rolling, I remember in school 
Yeah, way before social media, way before you're making these fucking videos. I, I, I don't even remember the context, but I've, I remembered <laughs> this for years. I would think about it. And I remember when you started doing the videos, I was like, they're coming ad nauseum now. Yes. You were, we were, we were, hang, we were like at a party or something. And you were talking about how you were, you were hanging out with somebody else in your class. And you were like, yeah, we were just sitting in the pickle the other day, making a list of drag names. My favorite was Lisa Carr. Yeah. And I was Which like, is so basic. That like, one's like, well, that's fucking an amateur hour at this point yeah. compared to Edith Ath. Okay. That's nothing. But I, feel, I still, that might be my favorite. Cause I, that's the first one I ever heard you say. Can I tell you the one that I think I might use for myself? If I were to drag, I was okay. going to say, do you have one that you've chosen? So realistically, I would probably just go by like, if, if I was like trying to actually be a drag queen, right. I would probably just go by Charlie Oz. Okay. Cause I like that. I think sure. that's cute. And I almost made that like my social media handle, but then I couldn't get it off of on to be the same on every platform. So I was like, oh, I'll do this other idea. Right. A star I was born. Um, Which is great. Thank you. (laughs) And um, anyway, uh, oh, what was I saying? What was I saying? The one that you would want to use. Okay. But if I was going to do a a pun or like, or like a, right. A comical reference to something. Yeah. I would do Victoria Malcolm. That might be my drag name. I don't, I feel dumb. I don't get that one. It's so obscure, but I love that. About what is that a reference it. to? Okay, it's a reference to the greatest movie of all time. Oh, now I've now Spice I've, World. Oh my God. That I have not the, thought about that it, in forever. It is a comedy masterpiece starring four bad actresses right. and Victoria Beckham. Right. <laughs> it is freaking hilarious. Alan Cummings in it, Elton John. Yeah. Like it is, there's so many random people. Meatloaf is the bus driver of the Spice Bus, which is a double decker bus painted with a Union Jack. It's, it's, it's hysterical. Yeah. Like, like I, I'm obsessed with this movie. That's it's, so funny. Like, it's so freaking random. Like at one point they have to go pee in the woods while they're on tour, and then these aliens come down right. while they're peeing. God, I haven't <laughs> thought about that movie in thirty and, years. And then the and then the the aliens they had this they say, they basically save Earth from an alien invasion by signing autographs, and then like that's then they just get back on the bus, and it has nothing to do with the plot. It's brilliant. It's it's so funny. Anyway, there's this scene where they take their nine month pregnant best friend to a nightclub. Of course, lo and behold, she goes into labor. Of course. <laughs> at the club and so they take the spice bus to the hospital and while they're waiting for her to to uh to give deliver birth, they're just sitting in the lobby and these parents come over and like excuse me are you the spice girls and they're like yes yeah, some of them <laughs> and they're like our son malcolm he's in a coma do you think you come and talk to him and they're like yeah right and so then they go talk to malcolm in the coma and Sporty Spice is like, <laughs> Ginger's like, Ginger's like, hello, Malcolm, it's Jerry. And Sporty goes, and I'm Melanie C. And Victoria Beckham is right by his face. And she goes, and I'm Victoria Malcolm! Because <laughs> he's in a coma. Right. And then they're like, well, how are we going to get him to wake up? And they're like, well, maybe you should take your top off. And his eyes pop up. Like, it's... Brilliant. And I just feel like it's such an obscure reference. I don't think anyone in this world could make me want to rewatch that movie that I haven't seen since like 2000. It's the greatest. I could go on a sermon about this movie. It is the greatest. It's, it is the most underrated comedy film of the entire 90s because it's starring the Spice Girls and they weren't right. respected in their time because they're women and because they're joyful. Yeah. Um, and they, they first album was so freaking great. And the I second had, album was that is okay. one of the earlier CDs that I owned. In it's the 90s so for sure. It was like Big Willie style. Uh, was That was the first uh, CD I ever bought. Uh, and uh, I think Weird Al's Bad Hair Day. And then, uh, yeah, the first, that first Spice Girls album. I'm fully obsessed with the Spice Girls. I just met Sporty Spice like last week. Did you really? I met Sporty Spice last week. Yes. I, you, I, I She was doing a book signing and I was like, hell yes, I'm going to meet Sporty Spice. I saw Mrs. Scary in Rent. <sighs> In oh. er, in the early two thousands, when she was doing, was it Mimi? Mimi. Yeah, Mimi, yeah. That was like the first Broadway play I like show I ever saw, and it really? was yeah ever wow. in my life. My mom and I were uh, both living there because uh, I lived there briefly in high school, and um, she was like, you know, we still haven't gone to a Broadway show yet. <laughs> We've been living here, and from Austin, Texas, so we had no access to that kind of stuff unless it came to the Bass Concert Hall or mm-hmm. whatever, and it was the tour always. So I was like. I was like, I kind of want to see Rent. 
and we went, and I think uh, I think Adam Rapp was still in it. Really? I think so. He maybe came back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that's like the only person I really remember, and I remember she was on the fucking poster outside, and I was like. I didn't even know she was fucking in this. And I was still yeah. a Spice Girls fan at that point. Oh, I've never stopped. I am. I live my life like a Spice Girl. Girl. I decorated my room here in LA to be kind of like the Spice Bus. I put, like, it's my version of that. It's like, I don't I know, can't like, talk shit. I have a 90s Central Perk vibe in my whole incredible. apartment. It's like, it's, I, I, lo- I fucking love the Spice Girls. And it's uh, so great. It's a life-changing moment for me. Um, I guess we're almost out of time, but <laughs> la- which I hate. But last, last question I can't help but be curious how you feel now that there is a dead queen and a King Charles. Well, like, does it, does it, as a Spice Girls fan, having that connection to the the royal family, I mean, how do you, how do you feel? Well, there's a King Charles. And there's also a Queen Charles. I was hoping so much you'd fucking say that. Listen, I thought about it before you got here. You, I wrote it on my etch sketch <laughs> I fucking, I was you like. You set me up perfectly, I darling. tried. I and I was like, I was like, I'll yeah, spike it. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't even want to let everybody know that I planned it, but I couldn't <laughs> help it. It escaped me as soon as you delivered. So that's fantastic. Um, Dude, thank you so much for doing this and taking thank the time. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks uh, for having me. Of course. Um, <laughs> Do you want to just tell everybody good night, maybe as Jen Coolidge or? Greetings, Earthbags. It's me, <laughs> Jennifer Coolidge. I'm I'm in character as as a fat loser uh, who seems to be in character as Liberace on a baseball team or something. <laughs> but um, if you could give alms to the poor and. Follow this poor bitch at a star Osborne. Kind of looks like his name is Astro, but it's not. Anyway, blasting off now back to my home planet. Oh. Scene. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh.